There we go. And yeah, welcome guys. Welcome to our live stream. Um, if you're watching this, we've got a good setup going here. I've got a couple of guys on the on the Zoom call um, that they can ask some live questions. As you can see, we set up here with the Abbott SXL. Um, we've got a couple of cameras set up, so you guys have got a good view. You're going to have a nice uh, overview, so you can see where my hands are going. Um, I've also got the two main screens coming in, um, so we can you can see them on screen, as well as. Um, um, the middle touch screen there so you can see what's going on there um, and then so as we're going through the different um, elements uh, you'd be able to follow along so the idea is also and I've got another camera here which I've got if I want to explain something a little bit more specific I can move this camera um, which has got some other things that it's focusing on um, the guys on the Zoom call, we've got, I think we've got Shailen, we've got Ayo from Nigeria, Shailen's from Waldemar, uh, Johan's obviously on there, Wandile's on there. If you guys want to jump in and ask a live question, just pop your name and uh, contact information to Johan in the chat, and Johan will send you a contact so you can ask some questions. Um, but we're going to take it quite simple today, we're going we're gonna to look at it from, a, um, from an overview point of view in terms of... Um, getting to know the layout of the console, what it's like to work on the console, what are the feature sets, what makes it a little bit different to other consoles. Um, so I'm going to go to that screen. Um, so the layout, for example, just to start off with is, this is a 32D, so it's got 32, 32 faders, which are a combination of input and output faders, depending on how um, we, we set it up in our central control. So we've got layouts, we've got input functions. So if I go look at that one there, you'll notice we've got um, layouts, VCAs, inputs, outputs, which are all different um, ways that we can operate the console. And then uh, if you don't press any of those buttons, you're in a basic format. Somewhere I've got noise coming through here. I'll try and get rid of that. Sorry about that. Uh, too many, I've got like 75 computers going here. Uh, I've, I've also playing some music. So when I demonstrate some of the uh, other concepts, we'll, we'll get onto those. Um, so obviously the way this console is set out, it's very intuitive, very visual. You've got a lot of information coming at you right from the, from the start. Whether it's on your faders, with your VU meters right next to the faders over there, as you can see, um, you can see next, this is a stereo fader, so I've got a left and right there. I've got my channel where I'm talking over there, then I've got the different feeds that I'm sending out to the, to the broadcast and to the, to the Zoom meeting. Um, and then we've got, even got gain reduction on here. We've got uh, the little blue dots that you see next to the faders indicate whether the fader's on the middle. Uh, if I zoom in there a little bit so you can see that. See those little blue dots there? If I move a fader, you'll see the blue dots gone. When I move closer to the center, from about minus three, it goes, it starts going blue. When I get to, it's very, really, when it's on zero, it's really blue. When I go past and I get to plus three, it switches off again. So if you want to just, from a visual perspective, find out whether your fader is on or about zero, you just look for your blue dot. Uh, I know some of the broadcast consoles have got um, uh, little touch faders where you can actually feel it when it's on zero. Um, but it's obviously that can also catch you up sometimes. So um, this one has just got a blue dot which works really great. But when you default the channel, it'll go to zero. Um, and then the way that it's set up when there's no uh, button selected within the uh, middle section, you've got 16 input faders, 8 output faders, 8 input faders. So it's what we call profile mode. If you're familiar with the old Avid profile, we've got, um, you always had your dedicated output section in the middle with your input faders to the left and right of that. Now, with 32 faders, I can press the input button and I have 32 input faders. Um, and then I can switch between those input faders using the central control section in the middle. 
And then if I press outputs, I've got all my output faders, or all the faders are output faders. And then again in the middle on the MLM, uh, which is the master live module, I've got all my auxiliaries, my groups, my matrix, my mains, depending on what outputs I want to look at. And then I've got VCAs, also in two faders, because I've got 48 VCAs. So you can see the colors have changed to blue. I've got VCAs all the way up to 48, uh, which is quite a bit. And then the last one is layouts. Layouts is something where you can literally uh, um, have any combination of any scenario that you want. If I wanted to quickly build a layout here, I could go to a blank layout. You'll notice that there's no, no faders currently assigned to anything. If I go to multi-assign mode or a layout assign on the screen, I can select, you can see that that red light is flashing over there by fader one. If I push it over here, I'm just going to zoom out again so you can see that a bit better. So you see the red light flashing. That will indicate where do I want to place a channel. So if I set over here, if I wanted to put the mic I'm talking about on this fader over here, I would certainly select it like that, go to my center um, touch screen, select the fader that I want, and there's my input fader now assigned. You'll notice that the flashing red light has moved on. It'll always go increment incrementally to the right. I can still move it around. But if I wanted to have the playback music, which I'm currently playing off my Mac over here, I would just go there or I can skip a channel and put it over there. You can say there's my Mac channel. Now there's on the whole layer, there's only two um, active audio channels, but I've also got some outputs happening. I've got the output stream, for example, that's going, which I'm feeding off of a matrix. So I can say I want those masters over here. Then I can go to my auxiliary master page uh, I'm going to put this camera over here so you can see that. So if I go to this section here, you'll notice in the, on my little M MTS in the middle, master touchscreen, I've got on the top of the screen, I can switch between what I see on the screen. So there's my input faders. Those are the two that I've selected. You can see that they're highlighted. If I choose the, the output channel, I would go to the matrix out, and there's my switcher feed select that one and now if I come back to my overview you'll notice that I've got that layout selected there um, and now if I go out if I exit that layout mode on this layer I've only got those three active audio paths going which are my channel that I'm talking on the music that's playing and the master that's feeding the broadcast at the moment on the master that's feeding the broadcast uh, I can select that which brings it up to the screen on the side. Um, sorry, too much happening. And then when I go to um, the, side, the side screen over here, uh, that's messed up there now. That's not working. Oh. Um, so if I go back to this view over here, when I select a channel, uh, either input or output channel, I will get their feature set onto the encoders above them, which is called channel knob uh, modules. So there's 32 knobs on each of these modules, which will take the form of whichever parameter we select. So I've only got my mic on this channel. I select my mic. I've now got my input section. I've got my EQ section. Um, I'm going to zoom in a bit again so you can see that. Um, I've got my dynamic section, my plugins, and then my different mix sends. Obviously, there are um, 96 auxiliary buses, or 96 buses, which is a combination of auxiliaries and buses themselves. Um, so if I go to my input section, I've got my gain, I've got my phantom power, low pass, high pass, polarity, direct out, delay, um, as well as um, all the different as, um, protection modes in terms of the automation safe or bank safe, solo safe and automation safe, my actual routing to left, right and mode and solo and then my mute group assign and my VCA group assigns. Um, on this middle section over here, you'll notice that just above that is my master control module 
my main live module. So when I select a channel here, it goes over to that side. So if I zoom out on this again, this section over here is, because this is the channel I'm working on. So I can see these features for this channel on the screen in front of me, but to access control, I can't use this module over here. So when I press select, it goes over to the right. And on the latest software that it has come as an option where I can either get it to go to the right or to the left. So if you're working with, with uh, depending on how you've set up your layout, if you, want, if you want feature sets to go to the left or the right because you've got your mast, your main channels on the right, you can have it go to the left so you don't have to interrupt your workflow. Let me go back out there. Now we've got back to our normal profile mode. I've got my inputs, outputs, inputs. So that was just a quick look at your different uh, layout options. The layouts themselves become very powerful in the sense where I've got um, quite a few layouts in the form of 48. Uh, 48 layouts which are all programmable the way that I've demonstrated. Um, the difference is the first layout, we can lock that to a snapshot. Um, what happens with that is if I've got that locked to a snapshot, if I've got a certain layout going, so I can clear this layout, for example, I'm going to go um, take that away quickly. I'm just going to clear this layout. This is layout one. Um, Okay, there we go. So if I go on this first layout and I say that I want my vocals or my, my drum kit on the side, from my VCAs in the middle and um, some vocal stuff and reverbs on the side here, I can quickly set up that by just going to those channels, um, selecting eight input channels. Coming onto this section here, I want VCAs. I can set some VCAs onto these middle channels. And then on the side here, I said I want to do some of my auxiliary, maybe auxiliary masters. If you're doing monitor, monitor desks, obviously you want to access your auxiliary masters quite quickly. Um, and then you can see on the layout, I've occupied it. And you can also see at the bottom of every fader, there's a different color switch, which gives you quick access to visually just see that there are different things. Um, these colors are not fixed. You can change them at any time, uh, just on screen, select, change the color, and you can change the color. So you can actually if you've got all your vocals in blue, um, all your vocals blue, all your drums green, all your guitars uh, white, you can have the VCA, the effects, the auxiliaries, everything to do with a certain section, all the same color. The reason that becomes handy is because you can actually filter what you see on your master touchscreen by using colors. Uh, in this case, if I I've made, um, uh, can you see that? So if you see there, oh, that's not going to work now. Oh, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah, I've lost my, hmm, I've lost the, the feed of the, the two screens. I've lost them. You can see them, but they're not playing along nicely. Uh, I'll go back to that one. So I don't know if there's a question yet from uh, any of the of our viewers. <laughs> uh, I'll have a listen to those guys. Your mics are on if anybody's got a question. Johan can um, anything, Shailen, Ayo, any of the guys on that side? Everybody's camera shy. No questions yet. Um, oh, thanks, Obi. I'm just looking at some of the comments on the, on the Facebook page. Um, quick question. Yeah. Um, the okay. I, I don't use S 
I don't use the I don't use the S6L yet. Okay. Um, although I'm trying to convince a few people to buy on this side. I'm used to the Yamaha. Um, so I saw how you were doing the what we call custom fillers on the Yamaha and how you were um, able to rearrange um, like a blank feeder bank. Yeah. Sorts. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so when you do that, um, you can. It's, it's it's very flexible. It doesn't matter. You can combine stereo mono signal together. You yeah. So your your apples DCA things like that. So every fader on the console has got um, dual view dual, dual view viewing. So any fader can be a mono fader or a stereo fader, and because of our, the way our layouts oh, work. Awesome. Any fader is also an input or an output. We don't have any fixed section, which is inputs or outputs. So when I build my my layouts, and that's what we call them, we call them layouts, um, mm. I can literally put anything anywhere. So I can have a layout, which is a combination of inputs, stereos, outputs, VCAs, matrixes, whatever I want to do. So when I'm working, for example, if I do a live broadcast, um, I want my VCAs for certain elements in a certain section. I want my lead voice or vocal or whatever the focus point is always in a certain spot here. And then I have elements yeah. to the left, which is which is um, directly related to the performance, for example. So if it's a piano-driven song or a percussive-driven song, I would set up a layout on layout one, actually, on the snapshot in that format. And then when I go to the next song or the next snapshot, that layout changes completely. Um, but I can also have, I've got with the 48 layouts, only layout one changes with snapshots. The, the layout two to 48 are fixed and you can label them. So I generally have one layout, which is all my drum kits with inputs and, oh, if, okay. and, and groups and anything to do with drum kits. So my, my channels, my group, my auxiliary sends and my effects returns. Next one is all my guitars. Next one is all my vocals. Next one's all my keyboards. Next one's all my... Uh, track lines, you know, and I build them up like that. And then I've got one which I actually, I literally la name, label it stuff. Stuff is my talkback, my MD mic, my tone generator, comms. my my comms, anything, anything that's just my little utility setup. Um, and then, so I can quickly access that's because you, because I can run 196 channels. So obviously. Um, with the 32 faders, oh, if, okay. if you set up if you set up your layouts correctly, you can quickly access anything without having to page. I can still page. I can page oh. all channels, or I can page in banks of eight, or I can page in one, where it literally just shifts across, uh, like you do on the S6 or in some of the other doors as well. But if I go to layouts, I can quickly just by pressing one button, which is actually labeled, um, I can label my layout so I can visually see what I'm going to and I can go, there's drums, there's choir, there's vocals. And and um, you can also then, one of the things people they moan about is, but if I've got my main VCAs here, every time I press a layer button, everything changes. I can do what I call, what's called a bank safe. Bank safe is when I make a channel or a fader bank safe, um, which in this case, I'm going to do it on this one. So this fader here, which is VCA7, is now bank safe. So whatever I press, even if I go to a, 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 a layout without anything on it, that fade is staying there. You can see it's staying up, no matter what changes, because I've saved it. So that is VCA7, it stays VCA7 until I take the safe off. So that, that becomes very handy for for your main control functions, like your main MC mics, your main um, artist mic or something like that, where I want to I want to quickly go to the drum kit, I want to go there, but I don't want to lose my feature, so I can bank save it. Um, and I can bank save as many as I want. One of the control options we have, which I can demonstrate just now, is you can switch your bank safe on and off. So when you switch it off, it'll release that channel. When I switch it back on, it'll bring it back, so I don't have to reset up. So if I wanted to look at a layer which has got 32 elements in it, but I've got a bunch of stuff here which is bank saved, when I go to that layer, I can't see all these channels. So I switch off the bank safe so I can see those channels and then switch it on again without having to change the layer. So it gets very, it's very intuitive from that point of view. Um, 
the nice thing, the, the one of the one of the main benefits of the layout system. Layouts are great, and a lot of guys have got custom layers and custom uh, workflows and stuff like this. But the layout, layout one being affiliated to your snapshots makes your workflow this pre, this next button in terms of going to your next snapshot. You know, vocal mics. If I want, always want my lead vocal here, but I've got 18 lead vocal mics. Every snapshot, I've just got it programmed that this is where I want that to come up. So as I go next, 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 this fader stays my lead vocal, but it's always a different microphone. Um, and different solo elements can come up. So when you're in show mode, if you've got two days of rehearsal for a show, you plan your layouts in such a way that by the time you hit show, whether you're running on time code or manual, when you when you hit next on your snapshots, you don't have to go, what's in the song? As I press next, the names, everything's in front of me for that particular song, which makes it very powerful. Um, so I'm going to ask everybody to give me two seconds of, I'm going to do something here quickly. I'm actually just going to quickly going to um, switch the software so you guys can see the two screens. So, so just give me a second there quickly. I'm going to do this so you can see what I'm doing on the Facebook. There we go. I'm back. Um, uh, all of that didn't really work what I wanted to do. I got my screens back, but I can't. Um, Hmm. There we go. So um, now you can see my control function, everything that I was talking about. So this is our main side screen. Sorry, I changed just now. I had to quickly go silent because I lost some communication with the screens. Um, we can't see it on the zoom though. Say again. We can't see all those stuff on the Zoom. We no, you can you can see it. Yeah, on the zoo, on the um, you can see it on the on the Facebook side. On the Facebook. Okay. Yeah. No problem. But quick thing, you mentioned something. I'm, I mean, digressing a little bit, but time code. Um, if you do multi track. Yeah. The um, do you do you have to? I mean, for video post production purposes, do you record more? Your time code on another channel separately, or, or is it embedded in this in the recording? I actually record. So it's also embedded, so I hardly did. It. So it depends on who's generating this uh, the time code. Generally, it'll be able it'll be an Ableton session or off of a watch out system or something like that, and then we'll actually get the guys to give us the time code off on a on an analog out. It'll come onto a channel. Um, and that channel, I will reroute. Into, I've got a time code input on the LTC input on the back of the console, so I'll reroute that into the LTC input so that I can pick it up on the console and run time code from that perspective. That also means then, uh, when rehearsals are done and I want to go to my multi-track session and run some virtual sound checks, I still have the time code, so I can practice with the time code um, and have that active all the time, which really helps. So yeah, keeping your time code on a separate um, a separate channel does help from that perspective. Uh, for if if you have it embedded, like on some of the video formats and all that, when you talk about sync, like your black and burst and all that, 
that that's a great syncing tool but we want time code actually to be read so we want our time code to be generated and come into our ltc input like you do on a grand ma console like on a lighting console you bring your time code in as an analog source and you'll you actually pick up the physical clock and then we sync to that clock with our snapshots um, so if i go here let's go to that screen there so on this screen, if you want, you can see on my format at the bottom, I'm going to use the mouse so that you can see my mouse. See on the bottom corner there, I can choose LTC as a format. And then um, I can go here and I can tell it to read. And now on the bottom left or right hand corner, you'll notice there it actually says um, LTC read and there's no clock there at the moment because I'm not getting LTC but as soon as I get LTC the digits will actually run there and then when we come back to our snapshots we can chase LC, LC, LTC by activating it over there and then when there's a new snapshot we can actually show time code information and you'll run uh, and sync your time uh, to time code on there so it becomes a very a very good way of, of utilizing time code. Um, hope that answers your question. But yeah, and, and yeah, we record that separately. Any other questions from the guys online? Hey, Chris, I have a question. Yes, yeah, Shailen. Um, if for a new operator, um, kind of standing in front of an S6 for the first time, what would you say is the general learning curve, you know, for them to just get it to an operational level, to just to understand the basic workflow so they can get on with the session, you know, and then obviously advance into, into things later? So that's a good question because obviously that's what face with a lot of guys when they when they think about potentially buying a console or where they're going to place the console. From a from a operator's perspective, there's there's two sides of this. Uh, the screen that we've got on the side here, if you look on, you know this this is our our control screen where we can set up the console, we can handle our patch bay, all of that kind of stuff. But once we run the show, that that screen becomes a great visual aid but we don't have to do anything on it everything gets done on the console we can access plugins we can access everything on the console and as you get used to the console you can get more and more uh, complicated in your workflows but from a basic workflow uh, the way that the console works is if you've got um, if you've got your your channel layout here you can see just above the channel we've got our, our uh, central knob module or channel knob module and above that we've got our our um, screen, your touch screen, and on the touch screen it's very similar to the Soundcraft where if I want the EQ, I touch the EQ. If I want the compressor, I touch the compressor. If I want the, the auxiliary sends, I touch the auxiliary sends. If I want to see the whole channel, um, for example, like this, um, I'll see that. So if I select, there's my channel that I'm talking on that's on screen now. So that's on my center screen. That's also similar to what I would see on my main side screen. If I had to go to that side screen, um, you can have quite a bit of visual input. So for a guy that's just walked up to the console, the, 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 the hope is that the console is in a working state. Um, I would never throw a guy in. You know, if I want to introduce him to the console, I'm going to give him a working scenario. In other words, there's some audio running, there's maybe a multi-track running, all that. Then it's a question of navigating the console finding out where things are, pressing some buttons, moving faders, you know, pressing, seeing what the different buttons do, uh, touching the screen, switching on, uh, selecting EQ, selecting dynamics, and then having a look at where things are, are allocated. And then when you've got time, you'll see that guys naturally get drawn to the touchscreen on the side and they'll look at inputs, they'll look at outputs, they'll look at the filing, they'll look at snapshots and all that. They might not know what all of it is, but they'll start getting used to it. So you can get a guy if he's, if he's used to an analog workflow or Soundcraft workflow or a, you know any other, most other digital consoles, what happens on a channel is pretty straightforward. You've got your capturing at the top. So if I go to the top of the channel, I've got my gain, my uh, phantom power, filters, my pan, my direct out, all those things. Next thing down, I've got EQ. Next thing down, I've got dynamics. Next thing down, I've got 
plugins, which is something new to the console. Um, and then I've got um, auxiliary sends. So the plugins thing is again also you don't have to run plugins. The only thing you would have to run plugins for as a point of you have to is effects uh, to run reverbs and stuff like that. But in terms of channel processing, dynamics. Hopefully it's going again. Yvonne can just give me an indication there if it's starting again. Sorry guys, I just had a weird message on the side. Processing. Oh, there we go. Sorry, guys, the guys watching the stream here. We had some, I don't know if it's connectivity issues or something, but should be back up now. Um, so, yeah, so if, you, if you're not used to the console and there's a working scenario, you don't have to do any patching or anything like that. You can get going very quickly, you know, select a channel, press the EQ, you know, turn buttons on the EQ, see what it sounds like. There we go. We go. Oh, there we go. There's EQ there. Um, you know, play with the um, do some different things, and you know, just fiddle. Because I think that's the problem. on any console. If it's already working, you can you can navigate and find your way, and you realize when you do things wrong. If it's out the box, you do need someone to talk you through it, um, because when it's out the box, in other words, I'm just switching it on now. Things like uh, the hardware scenario becomes a little bit more complicated because every every manufacturer, from a hardware perspective, the way that they connect their devices, the way um, everything is configured, there is a different way of how to do that. Um, so when we're in that scenario, those things have got to be done right on the console. Here, I can go to my devices page, and you can see what the devices are that I've got currently connected. I've got um, my stage rack, I've got my engine, and I've got my control section, uh, my controller here, which is all connected via AVB, uh, also, and I've got a MADI card as well, which is in there. Um, and then once that's all done, I can go to my patch bay, and I make sure that I've got the channels that I need patched, patched. Um, and then on different patching options on console, local, Pro Tools, all those different elements are there. but those are the kind of things that you need to talk people through. But if it's not, if it's already in a, in a working state, someone can get going on the console quite quickly. Um, if I had to get a guy that's, you know, worth his salt on, on any console, I can spend less than five minutes with, on him and I can walk away and I know that he's going to be able to at least just carry on with what's currently in front of him, whether it be mixing a show um, or just carrying something on. Um, and that same guy, obviously, in a couple of sessions, will really get into the hardware of the things quite quickly, just by time and exposure. I hope that answers your question, Shailen. Uh, it's the same. It's the same way, for example, on on Soundcraft um, or Yamaha or anything like that. It's very. It's about what you see in front of you, and the guys also think very well about um, their target market. If you think about uh, houses of worship, you know, volunteers, you know, you can't have a volunteer sit there and go, oh, what now? It's got to be very intuitive. And in those scenarios, almost always it's already set up. So it's a matter of operating. And on that operating side, you can get going very, very, very quickly, quite easily. Uh, the technical side, like it is with anything, you know, with Yamaha, for example, you need your back end knowledge of Dante and all that kind of stuff these days. On here, we need AVB knowledge, we need networking knowledge. Um, on Digico, you need your, your, your hardware knowledge of, of their particular systems. On Midas, you need the hardware knowledge on their particular systems. Um, but once it's operating and it's working, you can get going quite quickly. Uh, was there another question from anybody watching? Paul, if you make a change like that, would Aurea carry on? Um, what change are you talking about, Paul? Paul's asking if you make a change like that, would audio carry on? Not quite sure what he's talking about. Uh, he's referring to when you exit to Windows on the control surface. Um, no, it, I actually, 
um, if I had, if I had a there are certain scenarios where the fall over the audio will keep going as long as I don't interrupt the DSP process but I had to I had to physically quit the software because the software that I use to get what you see now on screen is a third party software that I've actually loaded on the screen which automatically deactivates every time I restart the system so I had to go out of the system activate the software and come back into the system um, which means I'm exiting the process processing so that's why it went quiet for a couple of seconds when I did that so yeah um, because I, I actually I actually quit I switched off the console so switching off the console can't have a failsafe you switch that off um, Yeah, yeah, right. It's, it's very flexible. Um, what's nice about the way that it's flexible is you can really focus in on your desired workflow. If you like doing things in a certain way, whether it is layout um, or even on your on your channel knob section over here, there's a, a button here which is called channel where there's a channel layout. If I go to the overhead view, and zoom in a bit. So this section here, yeah, if I go to channel layout um, of a selected channel, this layout, yeah, you can see there's different colors because I've got um, auxiliary sends there. I've got compressor, gate, and then I've got my gain, high pass filters and all that. But this layout, if you're used to a different specific layout of an EQ or something like that, I can edit this. So I, if I don't want my gate there, if I want, see there's a blank knob, so I press and hold that. And then it's going to start flashing. So I'm pressing the wrong thing. My bad. Um... One, two, so um, if I go, sorry, I was pressing the wrong button. If I press that button and hold it, you'll notice, I think you can see it on screen, that red black, that red knob is flashing. So because it's flashing, I can now take my mouse and go to any other parameter or any other place on the console where there is a parameter and click on it and that will become that knob. So if I wanted that to be uh, a specific auxiliary send, um, I can go make that auxiliary 9. And you can see there's 9, there's that one, and, it, and then the knob, it just, I touched something else so that I made it a blank. But as I'm pressing here, I can completely reprogram what that looks like. And you can see now it's got a whole bunch of auxiliary. So if I'm a monitor guy, I can have a, a layout under my channel section which is specific to my uh, um, monitoring scenario or if I want uh, my gain to be at the bottom right corner or anything like that I simply just have to select where do I want something to go so if I want that there and I say I want that to be my channel gain now it's my channel gain you can see it's also gone red and that is now channel gain for whichever channel I've selected so this channel knob section if you're used to a Midas XL4 or a way Yamaha is lined up or an SSL or any 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 particular way that um, the channel is laid out, you can actually lay it out the way you want it and the way you remember it, um, which is also very nice from a flexibility point of view. And I think that's what it's about. You know, if if you can if you can be comfortable, access things quickly. You know, you don't want everything to be. 75 buttons away, you want, to, you want to be able to press a button or be in a, in a state where everything you need to do for that functionality is right in front of you. Um, that's where the layers come in quite nicely. Um, and then the function keys, that, that's a whole different aspect that we can still get into. If you notice, yeah, I've pressed the function button. So this section over here, I have got 128 function keys. So a function key can be um, if I go to the main screen on my control section here, on my events, you can notice at the moment there's nine function keys um, 
program. If I press F1, it's input, it changes my screen to input page. If I press F2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to 9. I can then quickly just say make a new one. I can change that new one. I can call it um, bank safe off. I call it bank safe off and then on the right hand side of the screen I'm going to use the mouse quickly so you can see what I'm doing. Um, I go to the right side, I go to my triggers. So on my triggers I want to use a function switch. Now I've got 128 function switch. So function switch 12 is quite accessible there for me at the moment. So I can go to function switch 12 when it's pressed or released. So I can choose how I work with it, pressed or released. So when it's pressed, what does it do? What's the action? Comes over here and we can say bypass a plugin. Uh, if I had a plugin, I could be, I do actually have a plugin in this. If I click on there, it'll take me to a uh, um, specific plugin. You can see, uh, where is it? There's a plugin there. I've got a pro limiter on the broadcast. I can switch that pro limiter off and on. Um, where's my monitor buses? I can switch monitor buses. I can bypass. I can change the graphic EQs. My fader banking. Um, uh, different um, outcomes, modes, spool modes, sends on fader mold, multi assign strip mode. Um, I can have my light switches uh, on that function switch do different things and flash will be on. I can do stuff in Pro Tools where I can record and stop. I can go to specific snapshots. I can go to um, GPIs or GPOs, which is external sources. Uh, disable events um, so I can actually switch stuff on and off on my system I can go to mute all stage outputs so if you want to I can label that uh, all output mute whereas if the guys want to do a stage change without having me to go to a bunch of channels I hit that and it just kills all outputs um, or I can lock my system when I want to walk away from it I can do I can make it an oscillate the switch, all that kind of stuff. So this section here under control events is extremely powerful. Um, so, um, and in the, in the past you had to set these up for tap tempo and all that kind of stuff as well. That is not the case anymore. What's nice about the desk now is it comes with a standard uh, tap tempo button, which is always active right there and you can see it, it flashes. So I've got a tap tempo, which I can press at any time. Um, I actually use a control function like that, um, which I can show you now quickly. If I go back there, control function, um, where I can use under my triggers, you can have, uh, you can look at continuous uh, fader strips. Um, so I can look at a specific channel. So if I look at channel one, um, double click fader above input pan. Um, I can look at different elements of the of that channel and have it trigger specific things. So I can go to my channel one meter. So if my channel one meter, sorry, I just did that wrong. Channel one. Um, meter above, call that neg 10. So if the VU meter on the channel goes above neg 10, what must it do? And come over here and I can have it um, trigger my tap tempo, which I had somewhere here. Tap tempo, there we go. So the way that works now is if that, that's channel one, for example, but what I would do is I would take that and I would make that my click track that I'm getting from the MD. I would see the value that is sending my click track and I can tell the tap tempo, instead of me tapping that tempo button, tell it to look at that VU. As soon as the tap tempo goes, it looks at the VU and I can set the level of it. Obviously it doesn't, it doesn't catch anything anomalously and then as the MD is pressing Ableton tracks or, run, or the drummer is running his click track or anything like that, 
my tap tempo is always on on tune with the song that's currently playing i don't have to get, i don't have to sit there and try and wait four bars of tapping the minute there's been two clicks it's in and if it's a half time or double time it'll catch up on that quite quickly so those are quite 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 nice uh, effects to have other things under control that you can do um you can do fader start stuff you can do uh monitoring sends on and off depending on where your faders are you can do channel mutes on and off depending on what faders is using if you pull a vca down past a certain point it can stop a playback if you push it up past a certain point it can start a playback if i take if i wanted to record my show and i want to make sure i don't forget to hit record i can make it that if i've got vca 12 as an all band i can't show, start the show without pushing that up and the minute i push that up it hits record on pro tools um, so I can't forget to hit record um, and you know it can stop when I pull it all down again so there's quite a few things like that where you can automate to a point a, a bunch of stuff um, let me see what Darren's saying here so the largest frame size which they've just launched at NAM this year officially is the 48D so the 48D has got three input banks on the on the left two input banks on the right with the master section in the middle which means you've got six fader banks um, and that's great for dual operator because underneath here I've got a I've got double headphone outputs I've got monitor A and B on every channel um, so you can have two operators one is monitor as user A one is user B and that's also why you can assign your selection to the left or the right and you can actually have one guy doing a band section and another guy doing a vocal section. That works well in theater setups. What's nice about that, the control surface itself doesn't affect the, the venue system in terms of DSP operating. So in theater, you can use a 32D, go sit in the audience uh, in amongst the chairs, program a theater show. And when you're done, you can take a little 16C, which is about this big, and go put that in your control room and just go next 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 and run the show you don't need the big control surface you don't you don't lose any value um, the venue app on ipad there's a couple of there's a couple of um, apps on the ipad there's a vnc app where you take over the screen where you can actually operate the entire uh, or remote control the entire console there's another app specifically for a monitor engineer and there's another app specifically for your function switches so depending, I mean, if you're running, like I said, I've got 128 function switches, but I'm limited to the amount of buttons that I've got in front of me here. So I can have an iPad on the side that I've got a bunch of function switches on where instead of me trying to find and page, I can just hit trigger buttons or I can have a second operator hit function keys without having to lean across me and hit buttons over here, which could be sliding effects, um, muting certain mics or VCA groups or things like that. Um, so, because if I'm dual operators and the one guy's doing the band, he's in over there, you know, if he's standing at the kick drum, which is channel one, for him to get to my function switches here, it's going to get in the way of me. But he can have an iPad and press function switches on the iPad. So it becomes very intuitive from that perspective. Um, yeah, so I think that answers Darren's question. Uh, there's 48 VCAs, you're right, not 32. I see Johan's posted some links there which shows you the SXL products as they're available. The, the whole range is there, it starts with a 16C, a 24, 16C is 16 faders with the MLM and the uh, MTS, uh, sorry, with the MLM, so 16 faders, MLM, and a side screen. So no onboard touchscreens. The 24C is 24 faders, the MLM plus one uh, channel control knob and um, your center touchscreen, your main touchscreen. Then we get the, the 24D, which is 24 faders, three screens. Then we get the 32D, and then we get the 48D. The D is obviously when the displays comes in. Um, so you've got five control surfaces, all of them completely interchangeable with systems. So I can run the most complex 
three input racks, 196 channels with as many plugins as I want on a, on a 196 uh, engine on a little 16C controller. Um, and then I can run a 48D with 48 inputs on a little 112 engine. So the engines are uh, in 112, 148 and 196. That determines how much I.O. you've got um, in terms of what you can connect on your AVB system. Um, to Pro Tools on the AVB, you've got 128 tracks in and out simultaneously, which is built in. Um, so it gets quite... Um, so I can't read and talk at the same time. <laughs> um, what, what they've done is they, they, they're growing a family of products where all the inputs and outputs, all the I.O. devices, all the controlling devices, all of them work together quite seamlessly. At the moment, you can run two control surfaces on, a, on, on up to three stage racks. So you can have a front of house and monitor console where they do true gain, in other words, gain sharing, um, which is a little bit different to some other people where both consoles actually see a gain setting, not just the trim. And if you have a saved file, you can save, you can make monitors, monitors the main console one week and the front of house the main console the next week and your show files don't have to change because they both have gain presets built into them with offsets. So it's a very intuitive system from that point of view. There's talk of them adding a third console into that. So if you had a broadcast console, you could run three of them in that sense, but there's a lot of processing that has to happen in that. That'll probably be in version seven of the software. Um, hopefully, that'll be quite handy. Um, but yeah, they, they keep trying to, and as they're adding content now in terms of software options, or hardware options, everything is interchangeable with everything. You don't, you're not stuck with, if you've bought a piece of hardware now in the Avid family, um, you're not going to like have to buy other hardware now when an upgrade happens or when you want to expand channel count. Um, if you've got a big enough engine, so that's, that's the thing, if you want to, if you want to build up to a large format, you buy a bigger engine, but you can buy smaller control surfaces. Um, and then if you're running a big show, you can rent in just a control surface. You don't have to change out. It'll work on your engine. Um, so Darren's asking about what protocols that the, do the I.O. run. It runs on AVB. So Pro Tools runs on AVB and the entire network runs AVB. Uh, and it's only one protocol. In your, in your racks themselves, there is a Dante card available in the actual rack where it's a 16-way Dante card, which is either 8 in, 8 out, or 16 in or 16 out, depending on where you face it in or place it in the rack. Um, and then there's MADI cards within the engine. I'm running, for example, at the moment, um, Dante into the Zoom call, but I've got MADI going into a SRC DOT product to sample rate down to 48K into an RME box which does MADI to Dante into the Mac. Um, so uh, there's quite a few protocols involved in that sense, but within the Avid protocols or family itself, AVB is the only communication protocol. Darren's full of questions. That's cool. Uh, any, th any other questions from the guys in the Zoom call? It's very quiet. Are they still there, Johan? <laughs> They're still there, just muted. It's just quiet. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do, just for those guys watching that are interested, I'm going to break, I'm going to shoot a bunch of videos which are going to be a lot shorter on specifically some of the elements we've spoken about. So I'm going to look at snapshots, I'm going to look at control panels, I'm going to look at patch bay, I'm going to look at plugins. And it'll be probably be about 10, 15 minute uh, videos explaining those specific elements. Um, and I'm going to post those on our, on our Facebook and YouTube site so you guys can see those. Um, and if you've got ideas or questions about anything else, please don't hesitate to ask or get in contact with us. Um, if there's any other videos you guys look forward to seeing, uh, just let us know. I'll try my best to get those, those done. Uh, but thank you for watching. I think we're going to call it for there. We've got, been going for an hour now. Um, 
and then if there's any other questions keep keep popping them into the group if you watch this video a little bit later ask the questions we'll we'll get the questions and we'll answer you guys but other than that i appreciate it and thank you very much